And I, we're going to start with All Hail King Jesus and uh, that awesome hymn, Majesty. I'm going to ask you, if you would to stand, please, as we begin our service with this. All Hail King Jesus. Words are on the screen. And let's sing out this morning as we praise the Lord through music. Let's sing together. All Hail King Jesus. All Hail Emmanuel. together uh, this morning, Lord, to uh, recognize you as the most majestic one, Lord. We give you our praise this morning. We bring you our worship. We love you, and we thank you once again for this time that we have together to praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Let me share just a few announcements with you as quickly as possible um, before we go any further in our service. Uh, this is for all of our Sunday school teachers and workers. There will be a uh, Sunday school conference September the 27th at uh, Pleasant Grove Baptist Church at 6.30 p.m. There will be workers there for youth and, and adults as well as children and preschool. So I would encourage all of our Sunday school workers to be present for that meeting. And then um, we'll have a soul winning conference. There's several of you that have mentioned in the past few months that you would love to go through a witness training course. Uh, well, we're going to have a soul winning conference in our association September the 11th, which will be this coming Tuesday evening. So we will cancel our visitation program here at the church, which will free up our visitation teams to be able to go to that uh, soul winning conference. Uh, Brad will be going, and uh, so that will be this coming Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock at the Elkist, Elkin Baptist Association. And so we will not have visitation. If you need a ride, uh, can get here to the church, Brad will be glad to take you. Uh, he said he'd be here about 6.30 or so. And so the conference will start at 7. So I hope that you will attend that if you're interested in that. And then I want to encourage you to pray for me. I'll be getting revival services tomorrow evening and go through Friday evening at Mount Calvary Baptist Church. And uh, so pray for me. Pray that God will use me during this time. And uh, it, he'll just pour out his spirit and we'll have a, a good revival meeting. The services will begin at 7 o'clock Monday through Friday. And then I have just to hand out some information for uh, all the members of our child care committee. And if you would see me after, the chur after church, I'll be glad to get those into your hands. So if you're a member of that committee, please stop by and get those on your way out of the church this morning. And then this afternoon,
soon at 5.30, the personnel committee will need to meet. I'll need to meet with you in Tim Reed's Sunday School classroom. And then tonight, we'll also have a deacon's meeting following this church service tonight. And then Daryl Adams will be speaking tonight. He will be representing the Gideon Association, and we will receive a love offering. So I hope and trust that you will be here. Daryl has a wonderful testimony. And uh, so we'll be taking a love offering for the Gideon ministry this evening. And then finally, uh, just a word to let you know, Junior Teague, I was told earlier this morning, right after the first service, that Junior Teague is now on life support. Uh, the family has, some of the family has gone back up there this morning. So let's be sure and remember Junior and his family. Matter of fact, let's pause and have a prayer for them right now. Would you please join me as we pray? Father. Uh, we come to you this morning to pray for the Teague family, that you will be with them and bless them, those who are making their way up there, those who are already there, and certainly for Junior. We pray for him, that you will help him, Lord, not to suffer. We pray, God, that you will help the doctors to, to do exactly what needs to be done for him. And so, Father, comfort and strengthen the family. Give them faith and courage and uh, comfort. And we thank you for all that you're going to do because you love them. Bless them, Father, we pray. And bless our service here today in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Hank. All right, we want to welcome you to our service this morning. And for those of you who are visiting with us, uh, we especially welcome you. I'm, we're gonna, I'm going to ask you, if you would, to look on the back of the pew in front of you. There are visitor cards that you can fill out and give us some information about yourself uh, so that we could have a record of your visit, and we would appreciate that very much. And uh, at this time, we're going to sing through the chorus, Oh, How He Loves You and Me. And uh, members, let's make our guests feel welcome. And like Brother Danny said, you want to say it? Everybody. Everybody, welcome somebody. <laughs> let's, go, let's welcome each other. Let's sing together this chorus, Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Before we pray this morning and uh, for our offering, I want to mention uh, that uh, the men's ministry team is sponsoring this what is called Letters from Dad, and uh, this is an awesome thing that they're getting into here, and uh, they're having a kickoff barbecue dinner at Pleasant Hill uh, here in the Fellowship Hall Saturday, the 29th of September, 6 o'clock. Uh, PM cost is five dollars a plate. Uh, says for the best pulled pork you ever eaten. Now that's good barbecue. Um, so be sure and get your name on the sign up sheet that is located back here in the hallway. And that is letters from Dad. And and while our offering is being taken this morning, you'll see a video about this. And it's an awesome uh, thing to be involved in, especially you men. Uh, let me encourage you to pay attention to this because men usually do not write. Uh, this is it's talking about writing letters to your children, and, and it's an awesome thing to do. So let me encourage you guys to take part in this. Okay, let's bow our heads and ask the Lord's blessing on this offering, and then we'll see this video this morning. Heavenly Father, it's a pleasure to be here again this morning. Lord, I pray now that as we accept this offering, Father, that it would be used for your glory, uh, for what we do here in the ministry of Pleasant Hill Baptist Church. And, Lord, I just thank you for uh, the ones who have gathered here this morning for the good turnout. Lord, I just want to thank you for the cool day, the cool morning, and the uh, nice change in weather. And, Father, uh, just I pray that you'd bless our service as we continue worshiping you 
because that's what we want to do, Lord. We want to give you all the glory and the honor that we can possibly give to you. Bless Danny as he comes in just a little while and uh, speaks to our heart, Lord, what you have laid on his through your word. And uh, help us to be attentive to your word this morning, Lord, and uh, so that we can just even love you more. And, uh, Father, it's, uh, it's in your name that I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. My dad couldn't say the words, I love you. He couldn't say the words, Greg, I'm proud of you. I determined that I wanted to leave a legacy to my children, my wife, my grandchildren, and even my great-grandchildren. God hit me with a little question. It went kind of like this. If you were to die today, what would your kids hold in their hands tomorrow that would let them know that they were the treasures of your life? The Lord has given um, daughters this incredible God longing to be blessed and to be loved by your father. The letter from dad that I was introduced to about a year ago has given me the tools to implement the very things that I did not receive as a young man. We underestimate, we so underestimate our influence in our children's life. When I called my dad that night and I said, you know, Dad, you think that you wrote that letter, but, uh, but truth be told, it was really written from the hand of God. My dad found the heartbeat of a father in helping them say the things they've always wanted to say, but never found the right words at the right time to say it. In written form, you would not believe what's in these letters. He could communicate his heart, his hopes, his dreams, and his desire. With the help from letters from Dad, we actually went through a program where we wrote individual letters to our wives. We wrote individual letters to our children on the very things that they were having problems with. And I received a blessing in return when I saw what it meant to them. As I was reading the letter, I felt like we were the only two people on earth. To know that my husband took the time to put his thoughts in words. And he wasn't afraid, he wasn't ashamed, he might have felt a little uncomfortable, but it didn't matter what anyone else thought, he was thinking about me, and I'll cherish that forever. The one they saw 
was Christ the Lamb, a precious Lamb of holy love's most wondrous story. Heart of God's In the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean how singing this morning. I'm going to ask if you would to turn to number 328 or, or read it off the screen. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Would you please stand as we uh, sing this hymn this morning. The first and the last stanzas only. First and last stanzas. Number 328. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus. Greater than all sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, partly like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame, oh magnify the Wonderful grace. 
Thank you for your spirit that's here this morning. Thank you for helping us worship you through song. Thank you that through this song we've been reminded of how precious you are. We should worship you. We need to worship you. We must worship you for who you are and for all that you do for us. Oh, Father, I pray, help me now to communicate your word to your people in such a way that it will be a blessing to everyone that's here and to everyone that will hear this message. And I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow. Three weeks ago, I guess it was, I began a new series of messages entitled The Blessings of Salvation. Last week I deviated from that series, but today I want to get back into the series. And uh, today we're going to talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Thus far in this series, we've, I've shared with you how that God initiates the process that brings a lost sinner to salvation and to himself. I want to remind you of our Lord's precious words in John 17, 3, where Jesus said that eternal life um, is to know God the Father and the Son whom the Father hath sent. Jesus defines eternal life in terms of knowing God and knowing Jesus. That simply means that eternal life has to do with a relationship. A relationship with the one true God and Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Holy Spirit. And that relationship should be very precious. And God is the one that initiates the process that brings any lost sinner to himself and brings them into that relationship with himself. That is God's one great desire for every single person is to save them and bring them into a very real and meaningful relationship with himself. Because God is a loving God. He's a forgiving God. He's a merciful God. And He loves every single sinner and wants them to experience salvation. And so God, through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, God initiates the process. And the process is very simple. Uh, it begins with the mind and the heart of God. But God initiates that process. And what He does, He brings, He arranges. 
he arranges a meeting, if you please, with the sinner and the Word of God. And, and he arranges things and orchestrates things so that a lost sinner can come in contact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And once the sinner comes in contact with, and here's the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, in conjunction with the Word of God, he takes the Word of God and he convinces that lost sinner that he or she is truly a sinner and their sin separates them from God and they, they need to be saved and born again and that the only one that can save them and the only way in which they can be saved is to repent of their sin and put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Jesus alone. And the Holy Spirit is the only one that can illumine the mind of any lost person and reveal to a lost person that that person needs salvation and that that salvation comes only through Jesus and Jesus alone. And so God initiates that process, and he brings that process about. And once the individual, if the person, I would say if the individual, the lost sinner, hears the gospel, convinced by the Holy Spirit that what they hear is absolute truth, and they understand their lostness and their need of Jesus, at that moment, if that lost sinner will repent of sin and turn to Christ in faith, at that moment, the Bible says that when they believe with their heart and confess with their mouth Jesus Christ, as Lord of their life. They will be saved and born again. And they receive eternal salvation, and I will repeat, eternal salvation through Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God. And according to what we've already studied in this series, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, listen at the words of Paul in Romans 5 and verse 1 where he says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. So at the moment that a person is saved and born again, what happens? The Bible declares that at the moment a person is born again and experiences that new birth experience, at that moment God justifies them. Now what does that mean? That simply means that God, listen, God declares them, God declares them to be just, to be innocent, to be righteous, if you please. And so God justifies the lost sinner, and at the moment of that justification, they have peace with God. Because you see, we've already studied in this series that a sinner is separated from God in sin, and according to the Word of God, a sinner is at enmity in his mind against God, and he is considered by God to be his enemy. And so there's enmity, and then there's the, the enemy part of it that we must understand, but the moment a person is saved and born again, all that enmity is done away with. We not, listen, we didn't become, we, weren't, we were no longer enemies of God, but those who are saved become the friends of God and the children of God. That's right. The Bible says we become children of God, sons and daughters of God. And God adopts us into his very own family, and we become one with him in our relationship with him through the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life. Now, once a person is justified by faith, he goes on to say here in this verse that they have peace with God. That enmity is done away with. We're no longer, no longer considered enemies but friends. And so we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to share yet another blessing of salvation. And again, that is forgiveness. Forgiveness. Because, you see, I personally believe that a person can never really experience the reality of, listen, of having peace with God until they accept the fact that they have been forgiven. I believe that with all of my heart. And the reason I believe that is because of my own personal struggle. And as unusual as it may seem, and as unusual as it may sound, so many people struggle with this one blessing of salvation more than anything else. It is forgiveness. It is difficult for some people to believe in their minds that holy God will forgive them of all of their sins. And by the way, let me share this with you, that when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died for all sin. He died for past, present, and future sin. And so, listen, when Jesus died, he paid it all. That's what he said when he said, it is finished. 
He paid every sin in full, paid our sin debt in full there on the cross so that we can all be forgiven and have peace with God. But we will never experience, listen, the reality of that peace in our heart and our life until we have come to the understanding and we truly believe that at the moment we were saved and born again, God forgave us of all of our sins. There are a lot of people today who struggle with not only believing that God has forgiven them of all their sin, because sometimes if we could, you know, we as humans want to measure sin. I I don't really know that God measures sin. I believe sin is sin. I mean, if you miss the mark, if if I've got a big bullseye target back there on the wall, and I'm standing here with a bow and arrow, and I'm trying to hit that that target right dead square in the center, that bullseye, that's what it means to, 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 to sin against God. It means to miss the mark of perfection. God has a bullseye target of perfection that every single man is supposed to meet, but we can't do that. We know we cannot do that. We cannot keep every jot and tittle of the law. We can't be perfect. So therefore, when we're trying to shoot at God's bullseye, so to speak, the target of perfection, we miss the mark. The arrow falls short. The arrow never reaches that bullseye target. So we we know we cannot do that. But thank God, thank God, he's provided a way in which even though we can't meet that that, uh, perfection that he requires, We can be forgiven. We can be forgiven. And he does that through Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God. But many people struggle with, well, I just just can't believe that God will forgive me of this particular sin because we have a tendency to want to um, uh, sort of put sin on a scale. You know, well, well, if we take a paper clip from work, that's not near as bad as committing adultery. But stealing is stealing. I don't care if it's a piece of paper or envelope or if it's paper clip. Stealing is stealing. And sin is sin in the eyes of God. And so uh, when we think about being forgiven of sin, listen, we're talking about Jesus paying the sin debt for all time, for all people, for all times, and all sin. Doesn't matter what it is, how, how minutely small it may be or how gigantically large it may be. It, matter, it makes no difference. God forgives all sin through Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God. And so this morning, I want us to think about this whole idea uh, of, of forgiveness. And now this will be a two-part, this will be in two parts. This morning I'm going to share the first part. Next Sunday we'll come back if Jesus tears and nothing happens. And you've got to come next week. Listen, I'm going to tell you, you've got to come next week because I'm going to deal with some things about forgiveness uh, that I hope will be a tremendous blessing to you. And I hope this will be a blessing to you. But let's consider two things today in this message. Two things. Number one, I think we need to understand what forgiveness really is. So what is forgiveness? Well, I want to give you three definitions this morning. Three definitions of forgiveness that I believe will clarify that for us and help us to understand what forgiveness is all about. The first definition I want to give you is from Webster's Dictionary. And Webster defines forgive as this, and this is on the screen for you. It is to stop feeling angry or resentful toward uh, someone for an offense flaw or mistake now read that with me stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense flaw or mistake now think about this when someone when someone does something against us they have offended us and so if we're not careful that offense that 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 person offending us if we're not careful we'll begin to harbor hard feelings in our heart against that person we may even become angry as the definition gives right here it says to stop feeling angry toward someone that has offended us or someone who has a flaw in their life or makes a mistake toward us and so uh, we're very prone as human beings, we are prone, when we are offended by someone, we are prone, especially if we don't deal with it immediately, we are prone to feel angry toward people when they, uh, when they do something against us. And so to forgive someone means that you let go of the anger and you let go of whatever they did to you. Now let me give you a second definition. And this definition comes from Hebrew and Greek words in the Bible. For example, uh, let's, look at, uh, let's look at Psalm 32 for just a moment. In Psalm 32, and listen to David, if there was ever a man that understood uh, forgiveness, the forgiveness of God, it was David. Remember, he was a man after God's own heart, but he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and he committed murder. So listen, this guy, he, if, you could, if we look at it in a, from a human perspective, we could say, man, he was a big-time sinner. 
because he committed adultery and committed murder. But David found forgiveness for that adultery and for that murder. He found forgiveness. And here he's writing about it in Psalm 32. Listen to what he says in verse 1. He says, blessed, and that word means happy. Happy is he whose transgression is forgiven. David knew what it was to be forgiven. Now there in that particular verse in the Hebrew, uh, that word uh, means, and let me get back over here, that word means to, uh, to lift or to carry away. And so David was saying, God has forgiven my iniquities. He's lifted it off of me and carried it away. Isn't that good? He's carried it away. Now we're going to talk more about that next week. That is, what does God do with our sin? What happens to our sin? Okay? So, uh, first of all, it means to lift or to carry away. In Psalm 78 and 38, Psalm 78, 38, the Bible says, But he, God, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and destroyed them not. Yea, many a time turned he his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. Now, why was he angry? He was angry because they had offended him. How did they offend him? By disobeying his commandments. Just the way that every single one of us who are here today have offended God. We have injured him. We've offended him because we missed the mark. We missed the target. We couldn't keep the law. We disobeyed him. And it was a willful disobedience. You see, every time, listen, most, time, most people choose to disobey God. But it's, it's in our nature. When we receive that old Adamic nature from our forefather Adam, we had, before we were saved, all we lived by was that Adamic nature, that old sinful nature that is on the inside of every single one of us. That is, what, that is how God makes such a drastic and radical difference and change in our life. He puts his nature in us at the moment of salvation so that we have not only have that old sinful nature, but we have the very nature of God living on the inside of us through the person of the Holy Spirit that overcomes the old sinful nature that we received from our forefather Adam so that we can do things to please God. That doesn't mean we'll be perfect, but it means that we can please God by faith and through faith. And when we do commit sin, if we've been saved, we can come back to God and ask for forgiveness and cleansing, and God will cleanse us and forgive us all over again. And you say, well, how is that possible? Uh, well, listen to what the Bible says in 1 John. In 1 John chapter 1, I want you to understand that the same blood, the same blood that cleansed us initially at salvation is the same blood that continues to cleanse us after we're saved. And I'm not making an excuse for sin. Now, don't, don't you misconstrue what I'm saying here this morning. We're to live in, once we're saved, we're to live in, in obedience to God. That doesn't mean we'll be perfect. But when we do mess up, when we do sin, the same blood that was shed on Calvary's cross... The same blood that we trusted, the person in whom we trusted, that shed his blood for us on the cross, that same blood continues to cleanse us. Listen to what he says in 1 John chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. He says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we as Christians say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Now listen at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he, God, is in the light, we, Christians, have fellowship one with another. In other words, we have fellowship with God and we have fellowship with one another as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Now that word is interesting because that word cleanseth in the tense in which it is written in the Greek means that He continues to cleanse over and over and over and over again. So the same blood... The same blood that cleansed us initially at salvation is the same blood that continues to cleanse us throughout our Christian life. Now, uh, as we look back over in that verse in, in Psalm 78, 38, the reason that God was angry with them was because they turned away from him and turned away from his commandments. But the Bible says that he, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity. Now that word uh, there... And, and, um, and that particular 
uh, passage, it, it means this. It means to cover. It means to cancel. It means to put away. And then in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2 in the Greek, in the New Testament, in that verse, the word forgive or, or forgiven means to send forth. It is an act of pardon. And so what we have thus far is that we know that when someone offends us that we can become angry. We know that when we offend God that God can become angry. When we miss the mark and we fail Him. Now listen to this. I'm going to give you a third definition and I love this. This comes from Charles Stanley. It's not from me. I wish I'd have thought of this but I'm not Charles Stanley. But Charles Stanley gives us this definition and I want you to listen to it. This is awesome. Listen to this. He says, and I quote, uh, forgiveness, forgiveness is the act of setting someone free from an obligation to you that is a result of a wrong done against you. Let me read that one more time. It's on the screen for you. Forgiveness is the act of setting someone free from an obligation to you that is a result of a wrong done against you. Now, let me give you an example. I, told this, I shared this with the earlier crowd this morning. Some time ago, someone came to my home drove up in our driveway and they knocked on our door and they gave me this long sob story that they needed gas and they, some, uh, her daughter had had a wreck down the road and they were stranded on the side of the road and she didn't have but just so much money and she needed enough money to put a, get enough gas in her car to go to this wreck and help them get back home. And so uh, I, I wasn't really uh, keen on the idea, I'll be honest with you. I really didn't know if the person was telling me the truth or not. But I just felt led to go ahead and give the person some money. And so I did. I gave some, the person some money out of my pocket. And the person told me, he says, now I'm going to pay you back. I said, as soon as I can, I said, I'll pay you back. Well, I, I, didn't, I didn't hold the person. I, I wasn't going to obligate the person to pay me back. I, I really didn't. In my heart, I, I settled it right then. I said, this money's gone, and I'll never see it again, and I won't worry about it, you know. I, I just want to be, be uh, a good steward and and a good child of God and as best I can be and, and somebody needs help, if she genuinely needs help, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give her the money. Now, in, in reality, now listen, that woman borrowed money from me and she told me with her own lips and her mouth, she said, I will pay you back. Now, if I had so chosen to in my heart, I could have said, okay, you're obligated to me. You've, you've injured me and now then you've incurred a debt to me because you've borrowed this money from me. I could have become angry. I could have, become, I could have been filled with resentment and bitterness and all of those different emotions and feelings. But at that moment, when I handed her the money, I released her of any obligation. She was no longer bound to me whatsoever. I gave her the money, never expecting to get anything in return. But according to what he's saying here and what we've read thus far, Forgiveness sometimes, listen, again, we can, we can become angry and bitter and we can feel those feelings towards someone that has offended us. Uh, and, and he says forgiveness is the act of setting someone free from an obligation. So what if I had said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep my word and you keep your word and so I'm not going to set you free from this obligation of debt until you come and pay me back. Now you see, that's the way, that's the way sinners are living today. Sinners are living in, in, in with that very issue in their life. They are in debt to God. They've injured God by breaking His commandments. They are in debt to God because now they've sinned against Him. And the only one possible that can release them from that debt and cancel that sin debt in full is God. He is the only one that can and will do that. And not until a sinner meets his requirements and comes to Him on His terms and meets his requirements. But Charles Stanley said forgiveness is the act of setting someone free from an obligation to you that is a result of a wrong done against you. For example, a debt is give, forgiven when you free your debtor of his obligation to pay back what he owes you. So, he says that forgiveness involves three elements. First of all, it involves injury. Secondly, it involves debt. And thirdly, forgiveness involves the cancellation of the debt. The cancellation of the debt. Now keep that in mind as we go through the rest of this message this morning. So the truth is, every single person is a sinner. There's not one good, no, not one. Everyone has injured God in that they've fallen short of the target. They've sinned against God. Everyone is in debt to God. Every single person born into this world is in debt to God until, until 
They trust Christ Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, and the moment they do that, guess what happens? God cancels the debt. God cancels the debt. And so forgiveness has to do with this whole idea of our injuring God and being in debt to God, not able to pay our own debt. And that is another thing, and that's a whole other sermon. But we aren't able to pay our debt. There's no way that you nor I nor any other person can pay their debt to God. Uh, listen, we could have gone and died on the cross, but that would have done any good. Because we would not, we, listen, we could not have been, we could not have been a savior of ourselves. But God the Father said, in order for this thing to work, I'm demanding that someone who is perfect meet the demands of my law that says that no one can break my law. If you break my law, you're a sinner. And so what did God do? God, out of his great loving kindness and grace and mercy, he sent his only begotten son from the portals of heaven Jesus came down here and took upon himself human flesh and became the only, only one that could ever meet God's standard of perfection. And Jesus Christ lived a perfect life and he went to the cross and died in the stead of, in the place of every lost sinner who could not die and pay for their own sin debt in full. So Jesus went to the cross and died in our place so that he could and would pay our sin debt in full so that when we would come to Christ and trust him as our Lord and Savior, God had right, canceled. Canceled. And so forgiveness is an awesome thing. Now, let's talk about the basis of our forgiveness. Because you see, now listen, this is so critical. If we do not, if we, if we as believers do not understand the basis of our forgiveness, then we will never be able to realize the reality. It will never become a reality in our life. We will never be able to fully be convinced that when we were saved, or even after we're saved and we blow it, that God will and can forgive all of our sin. And so it's very important that we understand the basis of our forgiveness. So first of all, first thing I want to mention, I'm going to give you five things. Five things that we base our forgiveness on. That is God's forgiveness of our sin. Number one, listen to this now, and I want you to listen. This is so important. Number one is God's nature. We base our forgiveness of our sin on the very nature of God. You say, what do you mean? I mean God's nature is, when I say God's nature, I'm referring to the innate or essential qualities or character of God. Now, the verses that I'm about to read uh, to you, and I hope that you will read along with me and jot these things down, they, listen, these verses express these essential qualities of God. So look, first of all, if you would please, in Psalm 86 for just a moment. Psalm 86. Now, I want you to see this. My goodness, my time is going. Psalm 86. Let's look at two verses here. Psalm 86, verse 5 and verse 15. Listen to how the psalmist David describes God. And here, as he gives us description, we have these essential qualities or the very character of God. Now, listen at these. Verse 5 says, For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Verse 15, But thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and plenteous in mercy and truth. So the psalmist describes a God and he gives us, we find here the qualities of, that, that God actually has in his being. And notice what they are. First of all, he says God is good. God is good. That means that he is possessing and displaying moral virtue such as righteousness, honor, righteousness, honor, and uprightness. God is a good God. Secondly, he says that he is ready to forgive. Did you hear that? He's not only a good God, but God is ready to forgive. That simply means that he is willing, that he is inclined to forgive a lost person, a sinner of their sin, that he is eager to forgive. Do you see God is that in that light? Do you see God that way so often? 
And I heard Charles Stanley say this because he was raised in a, uh, another denomination other than Baptist when he was growing up. And the church where he, was, where he attended, they were very legalistic. And he saw God as, as the big judge in heaven who was sitting on a throne waiting to wrap him upside the head if he did something wrong. And I'll be very honest with you, that is the same, the same view that I grew up with as I was growing up as a boy. I've seen God most of my life as the God sitting on the throne waiting to pounce on me if I did something wrong. And that is the way that most people, now don't misunderstand me or misconstrue what I'm saying. God is not only a God of love and He's not only a good God, but God is a good God of judgment as well. But I want to tell you, God's very nature is He is a very good God. And He is long, listen, He's ready, willing, inclined, and eager to forgive anyone that will come to Him and, and desire forgiveness. Number three, He says He's plenteous in mercy. You know what that means? That mercy means kindness and compassion and sympathy. God is sympathetic toward us. God is sympathetic toward people and He wants people to come to Him and to be saved and be forgiven. But He says He's plenteous in mercy. And what is mercy? Mercy, listen, is this. In mercy, God does not give us what we deserve. That's God's mercy. When we say God is merciful, that means that God is not giving us what we deserve. What do we deserve? We deserve hell itself. But God it says, no, I've sent my son to die for you and I will forgive you. And so the psalmist said here that he's good, that he's ready to forgive, he is plenteous in mercy. Now go to Psalm 145 for just a moment. This is an awesome psalm. Uh, I read it a lot at night, right? But that would be the last thing I will do before I, I close my eyes to go to sleep. This psalm, it is a wonderful psalm. And here in several verses, the psalmist expresses g the qualities of God, the character of God, if you please. And listen to what he says in Psalm 145. Let's begin reading in verse 5. He says, I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and of thy wondrous works, and men shall speak of the might of thy terrible acts, and I will declare thy greatness. They shall abundantly utter the memory of thy, thy, thy great goodness. Did you hear that? Thy great goodness. And shall sing of thy righteousness. Now listen to verses 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger, and of great mercy. Great mercy. The Lord is good to how many? I didn't hear you. The Lord is good to all. It doesn't say the Lord is good to a few or the Lord is good to many. No, it says very clearly that the Lord is good to all people. Now listen to what he says. The Lord is good to all, and His tender mercies are over all. All his works. Going down to verse 14. The Lord upholdeth all that fall. You know what that's saying? Simply saying that those who fall down under the load of trials and tribulations or whatever it may be in life, that God picks them up. He picks them up. The Lord upholdeth all that fall and raiseth up all those that be bowed down with the weight of sin and the weight of trials and tribulations in life. The eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou givest them their meat in due season. In other words, he not only lifts them up when they're down, but he provides for them when they have needs. Thou openest thine hand. Listen to this verse. Thou, God, openest thine hand and satisfieth the desire of every living thing every living thing not just man but every living thing isn't that an awesome verse every living thing and so David is here he's praising God for his goodness and for his special favor for the righteous in verse 7 he says he talks about his great goodness in verse 8 he's gracious he's courteous he's considerate he is full of compassion that is he's full of mercy he's slow to anger that means he's patient and he's long suffering he's of great mercy that is kindness and compassion and then finally in, ver in Psalm 103 in Psalm 103 verses 8 through 11 listen at these verses Listen to this now. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Watch verses 10 and 11. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. 
For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. I want to tell you, folks, we, listen, the basis of our forgiveness is the very character and nature of God. He's a good God. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's long-suffering. He's patient. He's kind. He's compassionate. So when we think about the whole basis for our salvation, we have to think about God's very nature. And the Bible says, remember in that verse, that He is good to all. He is good to all. Next, I want you to turn to 1 John chapter 4 because not only do we see that that His nature is, listen, He's merciful and kind and compassionate, but listen, He's a God of love. Look in 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. Love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. God is love. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us. In other words, if we really want to see how much God loves us, then all we have to do is look at the cross. For he says here, And this was manifested or declared or demonstrated the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The Bible says that God loved us. He loves the sinners of the world when they are at their worst. At their worst. When we, when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ came and died for who? The ungodly. <laughs> the ungodly. And that every one of you who are here, including myself, we have all been in that category. Every single one of us. And the Bible says that Jesus Christ came. God loved us so much, he sent his son to come, and Jesus died in our place. He died for the ungodly. Jesus did not die for angels. If you're an angel and you mess up in heaven... You're out of there, buddy. You're out of there. But not with humanity. It's very evident that we are God's most prized creation. Did you hear that? Man is God's most prized creation. So out of his very nature, we know that when we go to God, we can go to a Father, a God that is of love, that is compassionate, that is merciful, that is long-suffering, that is patient, that will forgive. We can base that on the very nature of God. But there's a second thing. Quickly, my goodness, I've got to hurry up here and get through this message. Next, I want you to see we base the basis of our forgiveness is not only on the very nature of God, but on the grace of God. God's grace. And what is God's grace? Grace, listen, it's where God gives us what we don't deserve. Now remember, mercy is where God does not give us what we deserve. But grace means that God gives us what we don't deserve. And we don't deserve salvation. We really don't. The way we've been toward God in our lostness, and I remember my life before being saved and how I cursed like a sailor and smoked like a train and and drank like a fish, and I'm ashamed of all those things, but that's the truth. But thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, His Son, and through Jesus, listen, that unspeakable gift Himself who died for me on the cross. The moment I put my faith and trust in Him, God radically changed my heart, gave me a new heart, new desires, a new will. I no longer wanted to do my thing. I wanted to do God's thing. I wanted to walk with God and live for God the rest of my life. And that's what I've been trying to do ever since the day, that fourth day of February of 1978 in the privacy of my home when I knelt down by the bathtub in the bathroom and I surrendered my life and gave my heart to Jesus Christ. He radically changed my life. And I can never, ever repay Him. And it was by His grace because I certainly did not deserve it. I certainly did not deserve it. This grace is illustrated In a passage of Scripture I want to take you to now, in Luke chapter 7, I love this story. Man, I want you to really picture this as we read through these verses. Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. Listen at the verses very carefully, at the words as we go through this, and listen at this story. We're talking about God's grace, and how that we as sinners, and all sinners, none of us deserve God's grace 
whereby he gives us what we really don't deserve. Listen to this story. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a what? A sinner. When she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, and if, if you don't know about this, the, Phar the Pharisees were a very religious group of people in Jesus' day. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, and speaking of Jesus now, this Pharisee's thinking in his heart, in his mind, if, if Jesus is really a prophet, he would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. Can you see that in today's society? How many people, especially in churches, there are churches today, when if certain people are dressed a certain way or they look a certain way, they walk into the church, I'm going to tell you, they're not welcome. I didn't hear the first amen, but that is the gospel truth. There are churches today that you can walk inside the door and it's like icicles are hanging from the ceiling, and I'll tell you why. It's because they won't only want a certain type person coming to their church. I want you all to hear this and hear it well. Whoever God sends through these doors needs to be ministered to. I don't care who they are or what they look like or how they're dressed. Listen to this, verse 39. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who in what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto you. And he said, Master, say on. Now listen to this little story. And here's exactly what Charles Stanley was talking about earlier when we look at his definition of forgiveness. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon. Now he turned unto the woman and spoke this unto Simon and said, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint. But this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto you, her sins which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is given, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, now he turns to the sinner, the woman, and says to her, thy sins are forgiven. You want to know why he forgave her? It wasn't because that she came in in humility, with tears, wiping his feet with her hair, drenching his feet with her tears. That wasn't necessarily the reason why Jesus forgave her. Jesus forgave her because of her heart. She was humble before the Lord. She came in believing. It's very evident this woman believed that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be. Or she would not have come in and anointed his feet with, and, and, pray, and wiped his feet with her hair. She wouldn't have done all of this if she had not really believed. Jesus Christ, when this woman humbled herself before those people with Jesus and before God himself there in the flesh, God honored her faith, and through her faith, Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. She didn't deserve it. It was all by grace. By grace. Whew. And so, Ephesians 1, 7 says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. According to the riches of his grace. The Bible says in, he, in Ephesians chapter 2, For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of works, not a, you know, lest anyone should boast. 
So we're saved by grace. That is another, another part of this, this, the basis of our, our belief and forgiveness. It is not only God's nature, how good he is, but God's grace. Thirdly, very quickly, Christ's death and blood, Ephesians 1, 3 through 9. Let's read that passage very quickly, and I've got to close out. Ephesians 1, 3 through 9. Listen to this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us in the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the gospel, good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. And so, listen, the basis of our forgiveness is God's nature, God's grace, and the blood and life and death of Jesus Christ. Number four, man's repentance and faith in Christ. Man's repentance and faith in Christ. I'm not going to read this passage. Jot it down. It's Acts chapter 2, verses 37 through 38. The Bible says we must repent in order to be saved. And that word simply means to change one's mind about sin and the Savior. To change one's mind about sin and the Savior. And to turn from sin and turn to God. And the moment, listen, a person is not forgiven on the basis of his own human merit or works or goodness. Not indeed. But a person is saved, is forgiven on the basis of his or her repentance and faith in the person of Christ and his finished work on the cross on their behalf. And through Christ's sacrificial and, and substitutionary death on the cross, God can and will forgive sin, which means he will cancel the debt in full. He will do it. Finally, fifthly, the basis of our forgiveness is God's word. God's Word. Let me give you five verses very quickly. They're on the screen. First one, Psalm 103.3. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Psalm 134. But there is forgiveness with you, with thee, that thou mayest be feared. Ephesians 1.7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. He will forgive and he will abundantly pardon. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all, all, all unrighteousness. And so here's what happens. This is the blessing of salvation. When a lost sinner repents, of, has been dealt with and drawn by the Holy Spirit of God and convicted that what they have heard in the Word of God is absolute truth, that they're a sinner, their sin separates them from God, that G God loved them and sent Jesus to die for them on the cross, that Jesus died, shed his blood for them and was buried and rose again the, next, the third day. When a person believes that at that moment, they believe in their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord and saved their life, turning from their sin at that moment, they're saved, they're born again. God justifies them. God declares them innocent, righteous, and just. Not only that, but at that moment, that person is not only justified, but through that justification, he or she, uh, the, the person that is saved, listen, has peace with God. The enmity is gone. The war, the battle is over. The reason being, God forgives them of all sin. And what he does at that moment, he writes, it, it, let's say God, and you know there are books in heaven. The Bible declares there are books in heaven in Revelation chapter 20. Read it, verses 11 through 15. They're going to be open at the great white throne judgment of God where sinners, lost sinners, people are going to stand before God in judgment. The Bible says the books are going to be open. You see, everything that we say, everything that we do, the motives of our heart, everything, all of that's recorded in heaven. And so the books are going to be open. And let's say we're, we're, we die and we go and we stand before the judgment of God. And, and the Christian will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But we stand there and listen. You know what? The moment, the moment that you and I trusted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, you know what Jesus did, God did? He wrote our names in the Lamb's Book of Life. And in that book, where all of those things are recorded, that all the things that we've said and we've done and we've thought and all the motives that we've had, you know what God did? He did the blood of Jesus Christ, 
the blood just washed all of that stuff away. And the Bible says we become white as snow. All of our sins are gone. And God writes over that sin debt that we incurred to him many, 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 many years ago in our life. Paid in full. What do you think would happen if tomorrow morning I get a phone call at the office here and it's the bookkeeper out at Hugh Chatham Hospital and she says, Pastor Dodge, you own a piece of this rock, don't you? I say, yes, ma'am, I do. I've paid you quite a bit of money and I owe you quite a chunk of money yet. She would say unto me, well, Pastor, I just want to tell you, your debt to this hospital is canceled as of right now. I'm writing across that bill canceled, paid in full. I expect everybody in this community to hear me shouting. But you know what? Better still, better yet, the greatest debt that we've ever owed, a debt that we can not ever, ever, ever pay God has been, for those of us that are saved, it's been canceled. Paid in full. And listen, this debt wasn't paid with the blood of bulls and goats. This debt was paid in full by the precious blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of Almighty God, who gave his life, who suffered and died and gave his life so that you and I can go free. Free from the debt of sin. So that when we come to God, and oh, listen, you've got to come here next week's message. It may not mean a thing to you, but I'm going to tell you something. It, last night I was sitting there and God was giving me all this stuff and I was writing so fast, I, I was trying to get it all down. I was, oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What an awesome thing. As I just began to bask in the glory of what God has done for me. And you know what? If you're here today and you're saved and you're born again, God's done that same thing for you. But if you're here today and you're lost and you've never been saved, I want you to know you can be saved. If you've never been forgiven, I want you to know you can be forgiven. If your sin debt's never been paid in full, it's already been paid in full. All you've got to do is trust the one who paid it for you. Trust him by faith, turning from your sin, repenting of your sin, and turning to Christ, and let him write paid in full over that sin debt and washing you as clean and white as snow. Removing all of your sins. And we're going to talk about that in the next message. What does God do with our sins? Because you see, a lot of people think, well, if I think about this again, I, this goes back to my mind. You know, we have those thoughts, well, things that we did back many years ago before we were saved. I'm like, what happens to our sins? It's going to be interesting to learn from the Bible what God does with our sins. So I want you to come and hear. But today I want you to understand there is forgiveness at the cross. God will forgive you through Jesus Christ, his son, who shed his blood on the cross for you. Would you trust me today? And if you're here today and you're a Christian, leave here rejoicing. Leave here rejoicing today that God the Father loved you so much that he was willing to send his only begotten son to die for you to pay your sin debt in full. And that debt has been paid in full. Now you leave here this morning and you walk in victory. When you do sin against God, you confess that sin. And God promises in 1 John 1, 9 that if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That does not mean we have a license to go out here and sin and live any kind of life we, we want to live. No, 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 a thousand, a million times, no, that's not what that means. But it means that God has made provision for us when we do blow it and we do mess up, that we can be forgiven through the same blood that forgave us initially at salvation. You trust Christ. Trust him. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for allowing me to know you. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for calling me to service in the ministry. And thank you for always giving me somewhere to pastor and somewhere to preach. I know I haven't always been the best pastor or preacher, but God, I've, I've tried and I know I've failed often, but God, I can honestly stand here today before the host of heaven before all these witnesses who were hearing my voice this morning that I may have failed you many, many times, but God, you have never, ever failed me. 
And I want to thank you and I want to praise you today for being faithful. For being faithful. And Lord, I pray for any lost person that may be here today that uh, needs Jesus. I pray they'll come and surrender their heart and life to him and be saved. Or anyone who hears this message, I pray, Lord, they'll repent and come to Christ in faith and receive his forgiveness and salvation. Help us now during this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me?